first words you see in Persona 3 is the Latin phrase memento mori, which the game itself translates as, remember that you are mortal, remember you will die. It's an incredibly bleak notion on the face of it. However, much like the lively opening the text itself is set against, its implications are bright, encouraging you to use that reminder to pursue today. It's optimism masquerading as pessimism. And it's that philosophy and attitude that define Persona 3. Nearly every element of this game, from the music to the mechanics and, most of all, the writing, exists to ensure that you walk away from this game knowing that, yes, one day you will die. And that's okay, because life is pretty amazing. Even before the intro is finished, the chorus of the song begins to reinforce this. The god of fear here is death itself, and you can't run away from it. Trying to deny that it's coming or that it's there will only lead to it hanging over you more. Instead, you need to accept it, and ideally, use that knowledge to drive you forward. This is further driven home in the ending lines of the full version of the song. Trying to run from the dread of your own death is a paradox. It's something that will always follow you and always weigh you down. You can't get rid of it. Instead, you have to use it to push you forward to make the most of your finite time. In other words, you have to burn it, like fuel so you can live the brightest life you can. This exact idea is what drives the core gameplay. From the very beginning, it's made clear that your time is limited in every way it can be, with the first words of narrative text telling you that you will have one year to do everything you want to do. A clock hangs over you from the moment you enter the actual game, small major deadline to take care of immediately, and one big permanent one off in the distance. This pressure begins to weigh down on you further once you realize that, at most, you can do only two things a day, during the afternoon and at night. And as you enter the mid-game, it begins to slowly dawn on you that you literally do not have enough time to do everything you want to do. Your ever-present lack of time pushes you to get the most out of every day, no matter what. Make friends, study, see a movie, join a club, do anything other than nothing, because you do not have the time for nothing. This idea carries on into the dungeons. Every engagement with combat, regardless of the conclusion, serves to remind you of your limited time and impending death. Should you charge through too many floors at once, your team will begin to get tired, lowering their stats to a near unusable level. Contrast this with Persona 4, where you are more than able to go through the entire dungeon in a single day with no penalty. Not only this, but if you hang out on one floor for too long, the Reaper will come and, unless you're in the endgame, absolutely destroy your team. Your time here is limited, both by floor and in the broader scheme of each night, and your forces have their own limit. Every moment is precious and vital, and failure to recognize that will put your team in one of the worst possible positions they can be in. Perhaps most of all though is what happens if you fail. Upon getting a game over, this text scrolls by. I realize that among Persona 3 fans, this text seems like a bit of a joke at this point, but I encourage you just this once to look at it fresh and drink in its meaning. It's in these words that the game confirms yes, death is coming, and yes, it's always looming over you. But life is not about death. This is classic existentialist philosophy. French writer and philosopher Albert Camus once wrote in his essay The Myth of Sisyphus that the gods had condemned Sisyphus to ceaselessly roll a rock to the top of a mountain, whence the stone would fall back down of its own weight. 
They had thought with some reason that there is no more dreadful punishment than futile and hopeless labor. After this, he recounts the story of a man who had recently died and sacrificed everything just to live life a little longer before being condemned to an unholy fate by cruel, uncaring gods who only ever make the lives of mortals more difficult. However, in spite of the tragic nature of the story, Camus closes his essay by stating, one always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. Each atom of that stone, each mineral flake of that night-filled mountain, in itself forms a world. The struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. It's this kind of nihilistic optimism that makes existentialism what it is, and Persona 3 takes this worldview to heart. Here, Camus and Persona writer Yuchiro Tanaka take the same position. Life is ultimately pointless and hopeless, but it's that same pointlessness and hopelessness that makes life worth living by freeing us to give us a chance to make our own goals and form our own hopes. Camus feels we should look inwards to find peace, while Tanaka believes we should seek to form connections with those around us to make life worthwhile, a theme he would revisit in Persona 4. As far as Persona 3 is concerned, though, death is avoidable by continuing to live in the hearts and minds of those we leave behind. Finally, there's the actual core writing of the game's characters themselves. Death literally lives inside the player character, routinely speaking to you in your dreams and moments of weakness. Over the course of the game, you will meet with death, talk with death, and eventually befriend death, reinforcing that death isn't something to fear, but to appreciate as a means to give life meaning. Likewise, Ryoji, the character who personifies death, makes it very clear that he's not doing this out of any kind of maliciousness or cruelty. For him, this is just how things are. Aegis in particular goes through the emotional journey of accepting death from beginning to end. Aegis is unique because she is the only one among the cast who has fought death while neither experiencing it nor understanding it. The entirety of her story is based around moving from a machine to human, and a major part of that is learning to fear and understand death, not only for oneself, but those around her. However, it also comes attached with the realization that life's inherent time limit, its finite, ephemeral nature, is precisely what makes it so precious. Without it, we'd have no reason not to waste it. Not only that, but life's short time span makes every relationship we engage with beautiful and wholly improbable. Ultimately, she realizes that because of the limit we're all under, she can't hesitate, and as a result, forces herself to tell you that she loves you. Besides Aegis, all of the major characters' arcs contribute to the core theme. Everyone here has lost someone dear to them. Shinjiro, Akihiko, Yukari, and the protagonist lost their parents. Konomaru lost his owner, and Ken watched his mother die. Those who haven't lost a loved one yet certainly will over the course of the game. Mitsuru has to watch her father die, Junpei watches Chidori die, and the player will watch Shinjiro die no matter what they do. Death follows everyone no matter where they go, and every character is forced to engage in a renewed commitment to life because of that symbolized by the unlocking of their ultimate personas. All of this forces the player to not only consider their own mortality, but the mortality of their loved ones, as painful as that may be. Finally, every character and the player themselves have to deal with death one last time with the passing of the main character. I've seen players contest this ending as too sad or as a means to manipulate the player into crying. However, there really is no other way this game could have ended without completely negating the point I was trying to make. The death of your character in the arms of another who did everything they could to not only prevent it, but to understand it, is everything this game wants to convey in microcosm. And with your death, finally she begins to grasp what death and life is and what it means. She literally says as much in the game's final moments. And it's in these moments that Aegis takes up the player's torch of making sure they love those around them, and doing whatever they can to make life worth living, thereby ensuring that the Traveler's story will live on, cherished by those who bid him farewell. One telling feature of the broader narrative is that the antagonist is represented by the inverted death arcana, which represents exactly what you think it does. However, the normal death arcana, as embodied by our player character, represents nearly the opposite. Regeneration, change, and the cycles of life we all experience. 
The idea of Memento Mori isn't just about living aggressively, doing whatever we want in a nihilistic bid to get whatever we think we deserve. Rather, it's a request to the listener to take the dread we have of death and use it to push us into making changes in our life that benefit us and those we care about. Persona 3 is a bleak experience to go through, much like life itself. You know how it will end as soon as it starts. Even if you don't pick up on the foreshadowing of your own character's death, you know there's a finite amount of content in the game and you will reach the end of it eventually. However, also like life itself, it's made enjoyable and exciting by the people around you who you begin to learn about and understand. Death is coming, no matter how much power or money you have. But that doesn't matter, because you're here right now, with all those who love you and you love in kind. So remember your death. Remember we only have so much time here. Own that dread. And burn it as fuel to push you into hanging out with a friend you want to get closer with. To ask out that person you've been crushing on. To try something new and exciting that you don't typically think of as your thing. We're not here much longer, so we should do our best to make this life everything it can and was meant to be.